Welcome to the power of our story. We are a place of safety for our protectors to process the journey together with others that get it. We are, a, we are building a tribe in the gap where we are losing our protectors to hopelessness and suicide. We do this by storytelling as our stories connect us. You can reach out to us at the power of our story and meet our amazing community that cares about you and understand. Please don't spend years suffering in silence. All right. I'm going to go a little off script on the introduction. Uh, I'll start out with, uh, with what we have here. Barry and Kelly Young have been providing emotional support to first responders for over 20 years. Together, they do around 100 chaplain peer support ministry trainings every year throughout America, from California to Florida. Many times, trainings on suicide prevention or compassion fatigue will be strictly clinical, or sometimes trainings will be practical with no clinical foundation. Barry and Kelly have married the clinical and practical and the ministry aspects of psychological support into one day of training. Serving Heroes presides, provides one-day trainings from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. for only $99 a person. Not everything can be taught in one day, so they have level one, two, three, four, and five classes. Some organizations provide multi-day trainings, but this requires more time and money from the participants. Our heartbeat is to travel all over America, bringing cutting-edge training to those who serve and support our first responders for under $100 a day. Barry is not only uh, an instructor, uh, I consider him a friend and a mentor uh, and an inspiration. Uh, Barry's undying dedication to supporting our first responder community uh, by providing this training uh, to chaplains and peer supports is amazing. The amount of time that he dedicates uh, to doing this is uh, an, an absolute inspiration. And uh, I just, uh, I, I can't tell you how honored I am, Barry, to have you join us tonight. And so with that, um, we'll have you uh, tell your story. I want to say thank you so much. Those of you that are live, it's an honor to be here. I want to say thank you to those that are listening by recording. And uh, I'm just honored to be here. Uh, Todd, thank you for this invitation. I love you, brother. I'm just so grateful that God has allowed our paths to cross. And I want to just say um, uh, what a privilege it is to have you join us here today. Uh, my name's Barry Young. I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to tell my story. I'm from the home of the few, of the current Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, we just enjoyed our third Super Bowl, and Patrick Mahomes is only 27, so I anticipate at least three to six more uh, in my lifetime, should the Lord tarry. And so uh, my, my, my name is Barry Young, and my wife's name is Kelly, and uh, we go all over America uh, serving first responders. The name of of our, our ministry, our company is called Serving Heroes. And, and my story is a story of secondary trauma. So I currently, I'm not just an instructor. We do a hundred classes from Florida to California. I'm in Houston, Texas right now. Tomorrow I'll train 60 to 70 law enforcement, military, fire, EMS uh, on uh, our level three training down here. And then next week we'll just do it all over again. Um, but my story and my wife's story is a story of secondary trauma. And so I am not just an instructor, I'm also a practitioner. I serve at the second largest police department in Kansas City, Missouri. It's called the Independence Missouri Police Department. Uh, our police department butts up against Kansas City. Um, I've been a chaplain there for almost 20 years. Uh, my wife uh, is a professional counselor. She has her master's degree from University of Missouri. And um, uh, she uh, and I uh, run Serving Heroes together, and uh, that's where our story is going to kind of become. Uh, so I've never served as a police officer, and my wife doesn't serve in the military, uh, but both of us, in my opinion, especially me even more than her, 
um, have experienced secondary trauma. Now, let me tell you what that is. If you're not familiar with secondary trauma, it's where first responders who are traumatized intentionally or unintentionally traumatize the person they love. So let me say that one more time. So when we talk about PTSD treatment, um, so much of clinical focus is the law enforcement, the military, fire EMS that have been on the front line, the dispatchers that have heard the calls, the, the people in the infantry, the SWAT team, the firefighters, the EMTs, and all of those men and women need our support and our service. However, um, what we're seeing is hundreds of thousands and probably millions of men in America and women in America have been subjugated to a term that we clinically call secondary trauma. And that's where those that, that have never had the uniform, those that have never had the badge, experience the same trauma as those that did serve on the front line. And what happened is, I, 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 if you go to one of my classes, I like to break things down into layman's terms. Um, the the uh, street definition of secondary trauma is where the traumatized traumatize. And so January 1st, pardon me, January 11th, 1974, uh, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. My dad was a World War II Korean War veteran. Uh, for those of you that are from San Diego, yes, he is a Hollywood Marine. He went to boot camp in San Diego. He served in Amtrak's. Um, my, my dad was a World War II Korean War veteran. And what happened is at 17 years old, my dad got a waiver from his mom and dad to get in on the end of World War II. While my dad was on the island of Guam, um, he was shot at by Japanese Imperial uh, Army soldiers. And in the great words of the theologian Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. And you're 17 years old, you're a Marine, but now live gunfire is coming at you. And my dad did what many of his buddies did. Uh, he began to drink to treat the trauma. Uh, the problem is um, one drink for him was not enough and a thousand was too many, or pardon me, one was too many, a thousand was never enough. Uh, my dad became a working alcoholic. And so what happened is um, everything my dad touched failed. So after World War II, he married a woman, had my two brothers. And then what happened is um, that marriage ended in divorce. Uh, the Korean War broke out, and he was recalled into the mil into the Marine Corps. He was in the Marine Reserve. Reserve. And uh, by the time he got back to Kansas City after the Korean War, that marriage was completely dissolved. And for a couple decades, my dad was a bachelor and uh, was just hurting people that he met. And um, he met and married my mom in the late 60s. And um, what happened is, is... Uh, they met and got married and they had me. Now I was not um, an accident, but I sure was a surprise. And uh, what happened is very, very late in life. Uh, my mom and dad had me and my dad um, just was traumatized. And in, in the early 1970s, there was no PTSD. There was no emotional support training um, at that time. And probably even to this day, the majority of first responder agencies, the philosophy is this, if you need emotional support or mental health assistance, you're weak. And so that, that's not in writing, but it's, it's, it's an unwritten rule in most agencies. And so my dad spent a bunch of money to marry my mom. He spent a bunch of money to divorce my mom. And then very graciously, uh, my dad received uh, the gift of Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And he was able to be helped out by some very loving church folks. And for the first time in his life, he began to get treated. He spent a bunch of money to marry my mom, a bunch of money to divorce my mom. And then he got help and spent a bunch of money and remarried her. And this time stayed married to her for 30 years till he passed away. So growing up, I just thought it was normal that there was yelling in the house. I just thought that's how normal families I thought normal families broke things and cursed each other out. Uh, I, I just thought normal families, uh, the, the, uh, the fridge was loaded with alcohol and, and you didn't ever share your emotions. I thought all you did was lie, BS, and then hurt each other. And what happened is, uh, thankfully for me, 
Uh, my dad got help, and he began to experience victory in his life. And um, while I've never put a Marine uniform on, I got to see in my mom's life and a little bit in my own life, um, secondary trauma. Uh, as I was about to go to college, I felt called to help people like my dad. And so I went to college and I, I, I became a pastor. I went to seminary. I went to graduate school. And about 20 years ago, um, I became a chaplain for the Independence Missouri Police Department. And I began to ride along with officers. I began to see dead bodies. I began to serve. And I noticed something. I noticed that we were offering more clinical training than ever, more books than ever, more websites than ever. Never in the history of first responder profession, law enforcement, military, fire, EMS, have we had this many resources available. However, the VA says before today is over, 22 military veterans will die by suicide. However, according to USA Today, the greatest killer of law enforcement is death by suicide. And according to the USA Today, the greatest killer of firefighters is death by suicide. We've got more resources and more education and more websites and more books, yet what we're doing is not working. And insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. And years ago, I felt an overwhelming calling to start serving heroes. Now to put a brief pause, my wife's dad uh, is a Vietnam veteran. He was a captain in the army. And I think that she faced some trauma as a result of that, but that's her own story. Uh, God brought my wife and I together and uh, she has a clinical background. She's a professional counselor. I have a ministry background and, and we married the practical and the clinical. And so what happened is I began to see that what we were not, what we were doing in America was not working. And I began to see an overwhelming, another issue I began to see is almost all of our training was segregated. So the police chaplains, you're in this corner, and the fire chaplains, you're in this corner, and the military chaplains, you're in this corner, and the hospital chaplains, you're in this corner. And, and, and what would happen is I'd go to a dead body call, and um, I would arrive as the police chaplain, and then typically when there's a dead body, the fire department shows up, then the fire chaplain would show up, and We'd go to the hospital, and the hospital chaplain would show up, and none of us was speaking the same language. None of us had any idea what the other person was doing, and it was truly one hand, the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. And so we started serving heroes, and um, we, we, we serve law enforcement, military, fire, EMS, or anybody that's experiencing life-altering trauma. And we, 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 we just exist to give men and women practical tips, tools, and techniques. And so what I do is um, I, I believe in higher education. I've got a, a university tomorrow that's gonna be at our training and, and they're gonna be trying to get people in masters and doctoral programs. Uh, but I felt like I've gotta give people tips, tools, and techniques right now. And so what we do and, and what we've dedicated our life to is you come here for six hours and we're gonna put five to 10 tools on your belt that you can start using right now. And, and what I wanna say, for those of you that are listening to me, I wanna say three things. First of all, I wanna say this, don't ever look down on somebody unless you're looking down on them to help them out. Don't ever look down on somebody unless you're looking down on them to help them out. Everybody has hurts, habits, and hangups in their closet. Second thing that I wanna say is hurting people hurt others. And so my, most secondary trauma is not intentional. The majority of secondary trauma committed by law enforcement, military, fire, and EMS, it is not intentional. It's unintentional. But it still hurts as if it was intentional. The third thing I tell people is, is God uses people to heal people. Nothing will replace, when it comes to serving those affected by trauma, nothing will replace a man or woman filled. Here's the three C's we teach in all of our trainings care, compassion, and concern. Nothing will touch a man or a woman's life more than another man or woman that comes into their life for no other reason than to give them care, compassion, and concern. And the last thing that's kind of like the, the heartbeat of, of, of why we exist. So, so everybody's heard this phrase, hurting people hurt others, but we finish that off. Hurting people hurt others 
but healed people heal others. And one last one, found people find people. Hurting people hurt people, heal people heal people, found people find people. And you're probably listening to this broadcast today because a found person found you. And, and so what I want to say to those of you, if, if, if you're here today in the sound of my voice and you're hurting, I just want to tell you right now, uh, there is hope. Your setback can become a setup for a comeback. If you're listening to me and, and you're a, a wartime veteran, uh, I have many wartime folks come to our training and, and they don't feel like God can forgive them because of what they did in war. Uh, everybody wants freedom, but not everybody wants what it takes to get freedom. And, and, and so uh, what I want to encourage you is your past is a life lesson, not a life sentence. Let me say that one more time. Your past is a life lesson, not a life sentence. And so at, at Serving Heroes, we exist to give men and women that are an Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Fire EMS, we exist to be dealers in hope. And we believe that, uh, you know, some people say, well, well, why do you call it serving heroes? If you ever know anybody in the military, oftentimes they hate to be called a hero. Oftentimes firefighters and police hate to be called a hero. But this is why we've titled our company that name. Um, when there is an active shooter, um, what, what's the federal government teach? Run, hide, fight, get out of the building. What do law enforcement do when there's an active shooter? They get in the building. Why do we call firefighters heroes? If there's a fire, we teach people to evacuate from a very young age and in, in, in elementary school. But what do firefighters do when there's a fire? They get into the building. What about our EMTs? Uh, when there's somebody that's injured, I'm the first one to call 911. Uh, so many EMTs right in the middle of dinner, they'll see somebody struggling and they start rendering life-saving aid. And then for our military, our, our, our military, thank God for our military. Police officers say goodbye for a shift. Firefighters say goodbye for a day or two. And military say goodbye to their families for six months to a year and a half. And so I'm just honored to be here. Um, that's a little bit uh, of our story. And, and so we, we just go all over America trying to give people hope and possibility. And I, I firmly believe this. If you're listening to me in the sound of my voice, your setback can become a setup for a comeback. And the last thing I want to say that that's a part of our story is I say this in every class and every class is different, but there's a handful of things I say in all classes. And, and this, this one, I, I, I can't clinically prove it. I, I don't have a, a load of empirical data to prove it, but I know it works. If you're listening to me and you're in the sound of your voice, in the sound of my voice, can I tell you one small thing you can start doing now that will help you out? If you're overwhelmed with a burden of trauma, a burden of guilt, can I say one thing that can help you out? I don't know what it is, but when you help somebody out that can't help themselves, it always helps you. And so when people come to me for counseling, when first responders come to me for counseling, of course, we try to treat compassion fatigue. We try to treat secondary trauma. We try to treat accumulative stress disorder. We try to treat all these things. But there's always one thing that's in our rehabilitation package, and it's this. See a need and meet it. And when you help somebody that's hurting, you're going to help them out. But for some reason, you will always be helped out. And so I'm honored to have you here today. Um, my name's Barry Young, and this is just a small part of my story. Thank you, Barry. Um, Y'all can see now uh, what these classes are like. This That is Barry. That's Barry up front in, uh, in our training. Uh, He's a he's a great speaker. Uh, he keeps people engaged, uh, and uh, he teaches things that uh, uh, that are practical. That I, when I come away from uh, one of Barry's trainings, uh, I come away with with tools that I can put to use uh, immediately. Uh, and um, and he's right. Uh, you know, when I first became a chaplain, uh, I, I, I was still dealing with a lot 
myself, but one of the most uh, therapeutic and healing things that I do is help other people. Uh, and, and so that, that Barry, that's an absolute truth. Uh, when, when you, when you help other people, uh, when you heal other people, you heal yourself. So thank you very much. Um, so now we'll open it up to, uh, to questions and, uh, Chris. Barry, thank you for uh, sharing that. And, uh, what a charismatic guy you are. Uh, you you have the ability to really draw people in. That's a, that's an amazing talent. So thank you for that. Uh, what I would ask you is from your perspective and all the people that you've spoken to, a lot of times people with trauma, they do self-harm. They do, you know, they want to punish themselves or whatever. Um, whether it be through the word of God, whether it be through um, battle buddy, helping somebody else, what would your advice be to somebody that doesn't feel for whatever reasons that they can't forgive themselves. And a lot of times that's a huge barrier to get over. Um, if you could speak on that, I'd, I'd greatly appreciate it. Well, first of all, Chris, thank you for being here and thank you for your service, sir. It's an honor to be here. Um, I, I wanna say what Chris has said is such a powerful, powerful point. So, so I wanna say a couple of things about forgiveness. First of all, I wanna talk about guilt. I, I, I want you to consider this. In, in, in one of our trainings, we spend a whole part of the day just on guilt. And here's why. A lot of people think all guilt is the same and it's not. Let me explain what I'm talking about. The general population have a complete different guilt than a first responder. And let me explain that. General population only feel guilty when they do something wrong. So wherever you're from, whether it's San Diego, Seattle, you're in Canada, when, when you're a teacher, you're a lawyer, you're a mechanic, you only feel guilty when you do something wrong. Here's what's crazy about first responders guilt. First responder guilt is totally different. Oftentimes, these men and women feel guilty for doing something right. Let me give you some common causes for stress in the first responder. Let's talk about time away from family during life-defining moments. I can't tell you how many police, how many military, how many firefighters have said, I miss my son or daughter's birthday. I, I miss that date night with my spouse. I miss that game winning home run. But first responders feel guilty for doing things right. Oftentimes they miss life-defining moments because of shift work, on-call work, being being sent out in the course of military duty. Uh, another reason, so so my, co my brother's a police officer in Kansas City, my cousin's a police officer in St. Louis, my cousin had to take a suspect's life. The suspect was going to kill his partner. My cousin had to take his life. He feels he to this day struggles with guilt for doing something right. And so to answer that question, I always say this. There's two types of guilt, typically general population guilt, where they only feel guilty for doing something wrong and first responder guilt when they feel guilty for doing something right. So so how do I respond? A couple of things when people struggle to 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 receive forgiveness. The first thing is this. I want to quote Johnny Cash. Here's what Johnny Cash said to this, Chris. Johnny Cash said, and I'll never forget first time I heard him say it, I jumped through the roof. He said this, somebody asked that question to Johnny Cash. He had been in prison. He had committed adultery. He was on a second or third marriage. And, and, and Johnny Cash said this, when he was asked, how do you forgive yourself? He said this, I figured if God could forgive me, then I could forgive myself. I figured if God could forgive me, I could forgive myself. Number two, only because you asked, I teach this in all my classes. The number one rule of chaplaincy is you can't render spiritual care unless it's asked. And this is kind of one of those questions. The Bible says in Acts 11, 9, do not call impure what God has made clean. And the third thing I say when people struggle with guilt is this. Your past is a point of reference, not a place of residence. And guilt is a prison cell. But here's what's crazy. You're the only one that has the key out. So those are a few things because you've asked the million dollar question. So many people that come to me struggle with guilt for many, many things. And those are three things I often say. Thank you very much. Super impactful things. And uh, I'll be taking notes on those and uh, using those. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, sir. All right, Janet. Thanks, Barry. Um, it, I like that uh, you work with people with secondary trauma because 
that is one of the hugest things that is ignored. And uh, I know that uh, as a spouse, I was a spouse before I was ever a dispatcher. My husband was a police officer. And I can remember him calling me one day to say, hey, do you know this person? And I says, well, I, I know his wife. And he says, I said, why? He says, oh, he's killed tonight in a car accident. Okay, bye. And I hung up and it's like, what just happened? And so it's, it's so not looked at. I, I think that that should be part of any uh, training it, uh, and checkups, family checkups. And the medical profession doesn't even look at that. And so I commend you on the work you and your wife are doing because it is very much needed. Um, I tried to write down some, I mean, you have some great sayings. Uh, I need to, need to ask you to read, your past is not your, uh, your past is a life lesson. And then you said something about the after. I didn't catch it. Well, well, first of all, Janet, thank you for your service as not only a spouse, but as a dispatcher. And I want to just real quickly, if I can respond to that. Um, one of the things we talk about in one of our classes is so many times peer support and chaplains only focus on the responder, which that needs to take place. But we teach in all of our classes that we've got to expand our territory, that we've got to start serving the family of the first responder. And, and I say this very gently when I'm in front of a bunch of Marines or police or fire. And I first of all, I say, thank you for your service. But are you aware that your spouse and children are also making a sacrifice? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and so I want to say thank you for your sacrifice as a spouse and then also as a dispatcher. Um, if, if you come to one of our classes behind me, we always have in our big sign dispatchers. I think oftentimes dispatchers are forgotten. And what happens is yeah. um, a police officer, if, if a police officer seeing somebody raped, they can yank that aggressor off and put them in cuffs. If a firefighter sees somebody in a hot in a in a burning up house, they can run in and save them. If an EMT sees somebody that can't breathe, that they can start rendering life saving aid. The dispatcher hears the trauma, experiences the trauma, but they're powerless to tangibly stop the trauma. Which and induces, that's where our guilt comes in too. Yes, and, especially and, and, as a parent, if it's a child involved. Yes, and 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 so I just want to say thank you for your service those sayings that you asked here they are again your past is a life lesson not a life sentence so many of our first responders they're serving a life sentence for a mistake for a sin for a failure or for something they did right so your past is a life lesson not a life sentence and the second one i say when i'm trying to help people through guilt is your past is a point of reference not a place of residence your past is a point of reference not a place of residence. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Janet. Sarah. All right. Uh, Barry, thank you so much. So many good nuggets there. I really appreciate it. Um, I am curious with all the support that you're giving our protectors and their families, do you have any stories of kind of how you give them a different perspective and what's what that's done for them um like maybe even a an agency that has shifted or um what are what are some good stories from your work uh, let me share two off the top of my head and sarah thank you for your service and thank you for being here um uh, i was just with the jacksonville arkansas police department and one of the things we teach is debriefing. So in my wife's clinical practice, if my wife was telling her story, Todd, she would say, this is my wife's opinion, 80% of her counseling practice is listening. 80, you know, allowing men and women to emotionally unpack, emotionally unpack. You know, could you imagine not taking out the trash for a week in your house or not taking out the trash for a month? We have law enforcement, military, fire, EMS that have not taken out the trash emotionally in a decade or two decades or three decades. So, so one of the things that we teach is debriefing. And what I like about debriefing, it is where a skilled facilitator, uh, if you've, if, for those police that are on the line, um, oftentimes police officers are taught verbal judo. We teach listening judo. 
how to get people to emotionally unpack. And, 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 and I want to say this, anytime we do debriefing, we got to listen without judging. Don't ever look down on somebody unless you're looking down on them to help them out. So I was just in the Jacksonville, Arkansas Police Department. That, that police department brings me in twice a year. And five firefighters had driven about three hours to come to the class. And they weren't sure if they should come. And they didn't know who I was. And I get that. Well, what we taught in one day how to debrief. And, and, and for those of you that are listening that doesn't know what debriefing is, that's where you take an hour or two and a skill facilitator helps men and women that have been in trauma emotionally unpack. We're not providing clinical help. We're not providing a diagnosis. We're just helping men and women in a healthy way unpack their trauma because oftentimes they keep it compartmentalized because there's an unwritten rule. If you need emotional support or mental health assistance, you're weak. So I taught that and, and I, it, I, I don't want to lose the screen or I would read you the, the, the email exactly. I've never had this happen before. I drove home that night and I had a massive email. And here's what the email said. Barry, me and four of our firefighters came to your class. On the way home, we had a five-year-old child killed in a structure fire and we were dispatched to the scene. We immediately pulled out our debriefing notes and we debriefed the firefighters, the EMTs and the police on the scene. There, these are their words. It was borderline miraculous. The, the changes that took place just with helping these men and women emotionally unpack. The second story I heard was from a dispatcher um, in, in Longmount, Colorado. And um, this dispatcher came to my class and, and you're asking for a story and this story impacted me. So here she is, she's a dispatcher and a 911 call comes into her call center and somebody with a very calm voice says, hello, I'm John Smith. Uh, Ma'am, I'm about to kill myself. I've got a 357 against my head. And all of a sudden, the dispatcher starts trying to talk the, the, the person down. Hold on, sir. And, and, he, and he's very calm. Ma'am, um, I've got plastic. I'm in my bathroom, and I've got plastic surrounding my entire bathroom. My door is unlocked. After I kill myself, my kids are going to get my house. Do not break the door down. I don't want my kids to have, and, and all of a sudden the dispatcher's like, sir, sir, we, 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 let, let's, and, 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 and this guy won't even talk, stop talking. He goes, ma'am, I've got all my money, the keys to my cars, all my valuables. They're all by the door. So after I kill myself, just make sure my kids get that. Now, don't break down the door. And then also in the bathroom, um, I'm going to shoot myself. I've got a, a less powerful round, so it's not going to penetrate my skull because I don't want to cause any damage to the bathroom. And so once you arrive, don't break down the bathroom door. Just wrap me in the plastic, wrap the blood in the plastic, extricate my body, and the house will look perfect. And this dispatcher is pleading with him not to take his own life. And then all of a sudden, takes his own life on the call. And, and I say that because... She came up to me afterwards and she said, it was just so powerful that you let me tell my story. Because so many times instructors want to do all the instructing. And of course, we do do a tremendous amount of instructing. But there's power in tactical listening, tactical listening or, or listening judo. And, you know, there's a lot of people more intelligent than me, but she was just so appreciative. I gave her a forum to share her story. So those are two stories that have happened in the last couple of months that when you ask, ask me that question, that immediately pop off in my mind. Because so many times we think about trauma as we saw something, somebody tried to kill us, a fire almost killed me. She was never in danger. She was never in danger, but she experienced serious trauma that she's carried for two, 20 years. Yeah, that's really powerful. We talk about the debrief and how many times that doesn't happen and how post-traumatic stress can just snowball because there isn't a really powerful debrief. And I, I love what you shared. That's, that's great. Thank you so much for your work. Can, can I add one more thing, Sarah? Because yeah. you're, you're getting my synapses firing. If you're listening to me, this is one of the biggest questions I get. Because sometimes police and fire departments don't make debriefing mandatory. So at my department, we make it mandatory, but some don't. And I've had people ask me, well, Barry, how do I take a first responder through a debrief if they don't want to go? 
Can I tell you what I say to that? I And I do it all the time. If we do offer a, a, a voluntary debrief and people don't select it, you know what I do? I take them out to lunch and I go through the debrief over the lunch and they don't even know I'm debriefing them. Mm. And then the lunch will be over or the coffee will be over like, wow, Barry, I, I don't know what happened here. But and so I tell people, if you're listening to this recording, even if police, military, fire EMS, if they're not willing to go to a debriefing, don't freak out. Take them out to coffee. Take them out to lunch and don't tell them what you're doing. And debrief them at a time and you're, you're just helping them to emotionally unpack. Sorry, Sarah, you, you got my mind racing. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you. This is great. And I know inspiring many people who need to hear this. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And, and you know, that, that story you told Barry about the dispatcher that just immediately brought Michelle to mind because of the experience that she had. She had a, it wasn't exactly the same, but it was very, very close uh, an experience that she had as a dispatcher uh, where she experienced someone getting shot and dying, you know, right there. Um, and that was uh, something she dealt with for a long time until she, uh, she actually went through the, the 22 zero protocol. Um, so that was, that 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 story hit very close close to home here uh paul thank you very thank you for presenting the information this evening um i'm sorry i was out for part of it my cable system seems to keep intermittently going away and then coming back without apologizing uh, in any event, I, I have several questions and some comments. The first question is, do you deal with emergency department personnel in hospitals um, and, and life flight um, helicopter folks that are flying people from traffic accidents and every other thing where instant help is needed? Uh, is that something that you cover? It is, and, and we try to get those folks in there. Um, oftentimes, first responders want to come, but they're on call, and their schedule's so crazy. But we've had a truckload of emergency personnel like that or hospice folks, um, because so much of what we teach is, is has overlap into so many different areas. And, and so we try to just say first responder, and we have a really broad tent. Thank you. My next question is, do you teach in any of your courses the notion of a buddy check? I forgot to say this earlier, um, but Paul, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. And um, we, we do teach that. We use a different terminology. Uh, we, we call it an accountability partner, but, I, but we absolutely teach that. And I love that, the buddy check system. I, I ask because I have a lot of friends in law enforcement all over the country, and in fact, all over the world. And one of them just sort of went missing all of a sudden. And she is the commander of the gang and narcotics detail in the city of Los Angeles. And I've known her for a long time. And so I sent her a note and I said, Lillian, I just want to make sure you're okay. We haven't heard from you for a while. And she sent a note back um, probably within four or five hours and said, everything's fine. Thank you so much for doing that. And I just sent a brief note back and I said, good, that's all I needed to know. Uh, because it was, I just wanted to be sure she was okay. Um, the Emotional unpack, um, I find that if you, and, and I've done some debriefing um, voluntarily and otherwise uh, when I was in a municipal department, uh, um, I find that if you ask questions out of curiosity rather than out of judgment, you get different responses. 
The other thing I find is that in some cases, you need to do it one-on-one -on -one instead of in a group setting. And, and that's not always the case, but I actually had a female that worked for me and she would get in the unit with me um, to go out on patrol. And she was just really tense. And I finally took her to a little coffee shop and we sat down in a corner and I said, I detect that there is some tension here and I want you to tell me what it is. I am not going to, uh, it's not going to have any consequences for you. And so she started to talk and then she stuttered a little. And so I encouraged her a little more. And she said, my problem is you. And I said, good, now we're getting someplace because we can fix that. Um, I, she was in fear of me because of my education level. And she thought she could never live up to it and she would never get a good review. And, and that was just simply not the case at all, but she didn't understand that. Um, and then I wound up having her assigned to another platoon uh, with another sergeant who I thought would be more suitable to her um, particular situation. And it worked out. Um, but I, the, the idea was to ask questions out of curiosity instead of out of judgment. And when I asked what's bothering you, um, I stopped for a minute and she didn't say much. And so I pursued it a little further and got some food in her belly. And pretty soon she decided that between the chewing, she could talk. And that's how we got where we were. And so for that, I, I thank you. And I appreciate that very much because it kind of reinforces things that um, most people don't think about until it's too late, as you've evidenced by your own family situation. Paul, can so, I add two things? Certainly. Absolutely. Everything you said, I agree with, and I love it. And for those of you that are listening, I think Paul hit something that's so powerful there are certain people that in a public debrief will not talk. And so whenever we teach debriefing, I teach all the practitioners, the counselors, the peer support and chaplains. I give that what you called, you know what I call it? The meeting after the meeting. So we just had a police officer die in the line of duty and, we, and our, our police chief made everybody go through a mandatory debrief. But I knew we were going to have meetings after the meeting. And so what happened is when the debrief was over, the first one, four police officers were outside in the hallway, each wanting to have an individual conversation with me. And I love what you did with that officer. You may have saved her career. I mean, uh, and, and then real quick, back to the buddy system. I love what you said there. And if I could add something to that, what Paul said about the buddy system is so vital because the people that are closest to you are going to know if something have the highest likelihood of knowing if you're okay or not okay. And, and I want to add something just for the listeners. If you're a part of a buddy system, let me just add something that is oftentimes not taught. It's the principle of leakage. And let me tell you what leakage is if you're, if you're not familiar with that, for those of you that are listening. Leakage is where people, homicidal or suicidal, intentionally or unintentionally, let people know their intended actions. So let me say that one more time. Leakage is where homicidal or suicidal people intentionally or unintentionally let their desires to take their own life or self-harm or somebody else's life be known. And what's crazy is 90% of people homicidal and suicidal give off leakage. In the Uvalde, Texas mass shooting, leakage. I had a police officer come to my training and his partner said to him 30 years ago, he said, his partner said to him, what would you think if I didn't carry bullets in my gun? And he said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. 30 or 40 years ago, nobody was teaching emotional support for officers. One week later, that officer put his service pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. He didn't realize that was leakage. Very, very rarely. One difference between uh, clinical treatment for first responders and civilians. Civilians will oftentimes ask for help. Very rarely does a first responder ask for help. 
And so we teach in all of our classes the principle of leakage. And one more thing on this, because I love what you brought up. It's like you identified it perfectly with your partner or, or that person that was in your platoon. Um, oftentimes leakage can be said, it's the normal versus the abnormal. So if somebody's normally jovial and they're quiet, there's probably an issue or the opposite. They're normally quiet and they're jovial or vice versa. So I just love what you did there. I think that was so life-giving. Well, thank you. I, um, I had a thought and it's now escaped me. You'll have to forgive me because I'm old and that happens. Um, I resemble but, that but I appreciate very much your, your sharing that and, and uh, amplifying it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Um, you know, I remember in, uh, in our, in the last class in in the level two class, you were talking about debriefing and you were talking about uh, one of the officers that was in a, in a debrief and, and uh, absolutely was not, into it and 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 sat apart sat away from the group until someone else opened up and 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 talked and that sometimes is is what it takes is you know that that can really prime the pump uh uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a chaplain with the first responders bridge now, and we had our, uh, three day retreat for first responders and their, and their spouses in Columbus. And, and, uh, at one point, uh, one of the speakers was, was giving his testimony and he had all the chaplains come up to the front and, uh, and he asked, uh, if there were any of the couples that would like any of the chaplains to, to pray for them. And, uh, and so we're all lined up in front of the stage and there we stand. And a minute goes by and two minutes goes by. And then finally, one couple stands up and approaches one of the other chaplains and they they pray together and that was it the floodgates opened and we had uh we had couples coming up and and it was one of the most amazing experiences i ever had uh having couples come up with tears in their eyes talking about how how you know the 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 husband's law enforcement career had shattered family relationships and and all of that and they just have tears streaming down their eyes and it's the same thing uh with any time that that somebody who's experiencing trauma they they want to open up but they just don't know how to get started and and then someone else comes forward and that gives them that little spark of 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 whatever it takes for them to be able to to do it themselves and uh and when, when that happened then I, I immediately had had thought of what you had talked about in in uh in the training um it really does sometimes you know seeing one of their peers coming forward and oh well nothing bad happened so i guess maybe i can do it too Oh, Paul has another question. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah, I actually recalled what I was trying to think of previously. When we used to look at leakage, as you describe it, we viewed it as a cry for help. And how you approach that person to offer help uh, is the difference between them admitting that they're suicidal or homicidal um, and not. And so we would very carefully, and I'm not a clinician by any means, but um, we would very carefully um, seek to help them. And one of the ways that we did that was by inviting them to take a tour of the jail cells 
in the um, police department. And they'd never seen that before. And so we would take them in and show them that. And then we would, in the course of that, begin a conversation um, asking just about themselves. Uh, what's important to them? Uh, what do they enjoy? And, and from that, the responses trigger other questions. And you eventually get to the part where, yeah, this is really a problem. I say, good, come in sit in the lounge with me, we'll close the door. And we did that. Didn't always work, but I know for a fact that it worked in a number of instances. And I literally taught a course, a roll call on how to do that process. And the good news was that for them, uh, they were in the police station and the fire department was right next door. And of course, when you go into the jail, they ha you have to disarm them and you put their weapon in a locker if they have one on them. Um, and so they're now disarmed and they're in the police department with the fire department right next door. And so we had all of the resources close at hand. And when, when another sergeant came in and saw what I was doing, he would go over and notify the, the um, captain at the uh, fire department uh, to be on standby. And I never had to say a word. They knew what I was doing. So um, that's, I think it's important to recognize that uh, that is a cry for help. And it may not be very formal. It may not be very structured, but it is a cry. And sometimes when babies cry, they don't exactly know what they're saying, but they know they're complaining about something. And so there we go. Can I add one thing to that? Because I love, uh, Paul, I wish I was there to meet you because I love what you do. We, we call that two things. What you said, I thought was so powerful. It's how you approach it. And so at all of our classes, we, we talk about the three C's, care, compassion, and concern. People can tell when you're judging them, when you want to sell something to them, or then they can tell when you've got care, compassion, and concern. And, and I want to say one other thing that, that you just did. You practiced what I believe is probably the premier principle of chaplaincy, the ministry of presence. I can't tell you how many times I've been with a, a dead body scene. I've been in a morgue. I've been in a hospital. And you're quietly praying, God, what, what do I say? You know, somebody's dead or they can't breathe. And and very rarely do you have the right words to say. I mean, what do you tell somebody when their husband died, their kid died? I can't tell you how many police officers have told me, Barry, I can't remember what the blank you said, but I just remember you were there. And, and that's what you did, Paul. So, sometimes they do remember what we say, sometimes they don't. But I guarantee there are countless first responders that remember you were there. And that you listened without judgment. And you did it in private with the understanding that it would never leave the room. And so I did one-on-one -on -one what Sarah does in a group setting. She creates safety. And that psychological safety is what allows people to come in and tell their story and not be afraid, not, not that they're going to be condemned or judged or somebody's going to rat them out or any of the rest of that. It just stays right here. Amen. So thank you. Amen. Chris. Barry, one more question. And I, I thank you for your time. And I know that we're, we're a bit over, but is somebody who's in this space who helps so many people and, you know, that's where I've kind of understood the secondary trauma is taking on other people's sayings. What is your advice to those that are here and watching that get healing from helping others, but you're also taking on that other, other, other trauma, other people's trauma is what is your best advice to them on how to deal with those things other than, you know, when your gas tank gets empty, hey, I can't help you, but I got this guy, Chaplain Todd, that'll talk to you or so on. Uh, for number one, people, how would you recommend people recognize it? Because I don't think everybody always recognizes it. They say, I can help, I can help, I can help. And then two, once they do recognize it, your best advice going forward on how to mitigate that uh, secondary or tertiary trauma. Chris, great question. So let me answer the first one first is 
we've got to make sure our first responders understand the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue. So let me give the difference clinically. So burnout is physical exhaustion. And, and, and first responders are very acquainted with burnout. You're on call all the time. You're having shift work. I mean, how many police and firefighters, their shift is over at five. At 4.45, they get that three-hour call and they show up three hours late at home. And, and so what happens is, let me, let me clinically talk about the difference. Burnout is physical exhaustion. Now, compassion fatigue is different. Compassion fatigue includes physical exhaustion, but it also includes the emotional, spiritual, psychological, and the emotional cost of helping other people. So, so one more time, burnout is, is physical exhaustion. Another way I would say it is you're burning the candle at both ends. You're working overtime. You're working off duty. You're on shift work. You're on call. Burnout. Compassion fatigue is the spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological cost of helping other people. So burnout is physical Compassion fatigue includes these other five things. The reason I say that is that answers your second question. The treatment is different. So here it is. If you're suffering from burnout, rest will fix it. If you're burning the candle at both ends, you got to take some vacation time. You got to burn that time. You, you, know, uh, you may have to give up an off-duty job. So if you're struggling from burnout, rest will fix it. Now, here's what I want you to get, though. If you're struggling from compassion fatigue, rest will never fix it. And so what happens with compassion fatigue is you're empty. And so what happens is if compassion fatigue, rest won't fix it, you're empty on the inside and you've got to be refilled. And I want to say one other thing on this. Um, a principle that would apply is this, and I, I share this because first responders are experts at helping others, but they struggle to ask for help. Man, first responders are ex. Okay, so I say this to every cop, every firefighter, every military veteran I meet. You can never care for another till you first care for yourself. You can never care for another till you first care for yourself. And let me tell you who taught that. I didn't learn it in university. I learned it on Southwest Airlines. That's primarily the airline I fly with. And they say this on every flight. In the unlikely event that the oxygen mask drop, even if you have children, Apply your oxygen mask first and then help your children out. And, and so what happens is oftentimes first responders, and, and by the way, peer support, chaplains, first responders, and clergy struffer from, struggle from compassion fatigue at a much higher level than our civilians. Oftentimes we feel guilty. This goes back to what you said earlier. We feel guilty ministering to our needs or putting our family first. I tell every first responder, don't feel guilty for putting your needs and your family's needs above other people. So I just want to say it one more time for those of you that are listening. You can't care for another till you first care for yourself. So, man, we are just laying. Thank you for that question. As uh, as you put it, I believe it was in the, the level one training. Sometimes a chaplain needs a chaplain. Amen. All right. Well, this has been awesome. All right. We can go ahead and turn the recording off.